of the court rule and because of the professionalization of the judges in Michigan. Which leads me to uh, my next point. Uh, the tribal judiciary has changed dramatically since 1978. Now that tribes have some resources, and I think also, not to toot my own horn, but to toot the horn of the generation of law professors before me, uh, there are more and more Indian law professors available to serve on appellate courts for tribal courts, uh, and, and occasionally trial courts as well. And I want to highlight something about myself. I'm an appellate judge for several different Indian tribes. Uh, the first tribe I started working for is the Pokagon Band, the Potawatomi Indians, and I want to add that Mike Witoski, who's the chief judge there, was absolutely instrumental along with Justice Michael Kavanaugh of the Michigan Supreme Court in getting Rule 2.615 enacted. Um, the, I, I serve on the Pokagon Band uh, Appellate Court, I serve on the Nottawasepi Huron Band of Potawatomi Indians Appellate Court, and I'm the chief justice of the, of the Porch Band uh, Supreme Court, I also serve on the Hoopa Valley Tribe Appellate Court, and I, I'm supposed to sign a contract later today for uh, to, to work with the Lower Elwha uh, Sklalem Tribe in Washington State. And all of these are great honors for me, the ability to be able to participate as an appellate judge and to provide whatever services I can to, to those courts and to those communities is, 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 a great, is an important thing for me. Um, but it's something that uh, professors who became tribal judges, people like Bob Clinton and Frank Palmersheim have been doing for a long time now. They sort of paved the way for this. Um, and I want to highlight the difference, I think, between appellate judges and tribal courts and trial judges. Many of you in the audience, I suspect, are trial judges. And you, in many ways, are the real judges for tribes. Um, you know, you do the hard work that I couldn't even imagine to begin doing. Because on a day-to-day -day basis, you hold hearings, you decide questions of evidence. Uh, evidence is one of those things I, if, if I was a trial judge and somebody raised, made an objection, my initial reaction would be to think about watching maybe a law and order or something in order to get an idea of what, how to respond to an objection. I would have no idea. And you have to do that every day. You have to deal with um, the administration of courts that as appellate judges, we get to swoop in, read a brief, listen to an oral argument, write an opinion, and we're gone. Um, and so I want to emphasize, I think, that the work that trial judges do in Indian country is beyond amazing. So continuing on with the professionalization of the judiciary I mentioned in the 1970s, many communities um, had chosen to uh, hire non-law trained judges and court staff in order because of resources and finances. And there, are, there remain many reservations where there just aren't enough lawyers around to, uh, to actually handle a case. I've, formerly worked as an appellate judge for the Turtle Mountain Man of, of Chippewa Indians in northwestern North Dakota, and I was astounded by the number of lay advocates they have there and what a market there is. It's almost like the lay advocates run law firms around town and around the reservation. And the, one of the reasons for that is that there literally was only two um, licensed North Dakota attorneys within 75 miles of the reservation. And only one of them really was interested in practicing in tribal court. So it was, it's difficult to find lawyers. Um, I, would, I would sort of create a structure to give you a sense of where tribal judges are right now. And I think this is really interesting. I was reading in the New York Times yesterday that um, conservative Republican uh, political candidates are saying that even the Supreme Court should have term limits and trying to rein in uh, the, the independence of the federal judiciary. I think tribes have been working on this and have a wide variety of um, structures in place on the judicial independence of the judiciary and also the, 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 the qualifications of a judge. So I think of it as um, you can have tribal judges and this is all perfectly legitimate. Some judges will be, late, uh, will be lawyers and some will not. You can have some judges who are tribal members and some who are not. And you can have some judges who are elders and some who are not. And you can have Trump judges who are appointed by a tribal government policymaker, say the executive branch or the tribal council, and you can have some that are elected. Uh, and all of these kinds of things are in play. I'm sure there is a, a tribal court that has a combination of all of these things. Uh, my favorite appellate court is the one that my wife sits on, Winona Single. She's a professor here with me at Michigan State. She's a member of the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians, and her court consists of three tribal members, which is relatively unusual, and this is an appellate court, one of whom, two of whom are uh, 
law trained, they're actually lawyers, and a third is a tribal elder. And it keeps an, a very interesting mix of individuals on the court, where you have people who are not law trained intermingling and cooperating and discussing things uh, of substance with people who are law trained. Conceivably, you could have tribal members and non-tribal members sitting on that court, although there does have to be, under the rule, of, uh, at least one tribal member. Um, and you can also have, and they are all appointed, so they could conceivably be, um, you know, they, they are picked by a, a, at least at Little Traverse, it's a much similar structure to the, the United States in which the executive nominates someone and then the legislature holds an actual confirmation hearing and makes a decision on that person. It's all incredibly sophisticated. Um, right now I think I'm going to move towards discussing the, what I call the top 10 tribal court opinions. And I'm going to start with one from Little Traverse. And I wanted to be able to have each of these 10 sort of cover a, a, sort of a subject area of interest in tribal courts in the modern era. So the first case, I don't even know exactly what it's captioned, but we usually call it In Re Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians, and I would call it uh, the Advisory Opinions case, and that's essentially what it's called. And it was a case in which the tribal government sought an advisory opinion from the Little Traverse uh, judiciary. And this was during a period of time in which the Little Traverse Constitution and their newly recognized tribe back in 1994 had not yet been uh, adopted and voted upon by the Little Traverse voters. They were operating under a, an interim constitution. And the court had adopted a court rule that allowed for uh, advisory opinions in certain contexts. And without going too much into detail, I think what the court decided, uh, they sat on bonk all of the judges of the court, both the trial and appellate level, um, uh, deliberated over this case, and they split two to two on whether or not that the court, whether or not the court was authorized under under the interim constitution and and then the draft constitution that would actually become the constitution uh, a few years later, whether or not they were authorized to issue advisory opinions. You might know, from, you know, under federal law, in Article Three of the Constitution, in, uh, federal judges are not allowed. And that was one of the very first cases ever in the Supreme Court. Federal judges are not allowed to issue advisory opinions. And the a majority of the court, but, well, the two, the plurality, which, uh, and they split on this, decided to follow that kind of rule, and that there were, there were good reasons not to uh, issue advisory opinions. There was no argument on the other side. There was no real case in controversy, and they adopted, uh, and they, they adopted the reasoning of other tribal courts, which is very important, courts like Navajo, um, court, some of the courts out in the Pacific Northwest as well. And also Grand Traverse Band, which is my tribe, so I, I, I guess we influence them in some ways. They're a neighboring tribe. And the other side said, look, you know, what's, what's the big deal about issuing advisory opinions? Um, you know, and in fact made an argument, I don't know if it was persuasive, but I'll tell you what, it's very interesting. Made an argument that tribe, tribal courts are just as political as any other branch of government. Um, that there's nothing in a tribe's traditions or customs that would prohibit it from behaving in a political manner and from, in, from participating in the political discussion. And when a, the, other, the other political branches of government ask the judiciary a question, the judiciary should participate in, in that activity. So it was a fantastic uh, a series of opinions that brought out uh, cases from other tribal courts, brought out cases from federal and state courts, brought out tribal customs and traditions, and really was a fantastic discussion of tribal political theory and much of it was written by lawyers, but there were non-lawyers also on the appellate bench that um, were contributing to the decision as well. I want to move on to some of the other top cases. Uh, the next one I have down is actually what I would call a civil rights case called Allen versus Cherokee Nation Tribal Council. This is an opinion about the Cherokee Freedmen, the rights of the Cherokee Freedmen to vote in elections for, with the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Um, I picked this case, it's a little bit older now, um, and it involved uh, an earlier version of the Cherokee Constitution that uh, apparently is no longer in place, and reversed a prior decision of the Cherokee Nation, back then it wasn't the Cherokee Nation Supreme Court, it was the Cherokee Nation Judicial Appeals Tribunal, and they it reversed an earlier decision in which the court said that the Cherokee Freedmen do not have the right to citizenship and to, to vote in tribal elections. And this opinion, which was split again two to one, 
reverse that older case and is a fantastic read if for no other reason that it was authored in large part by the current dean at Arkansas Fayetteville, Stacy Leeds, who is a uh, former uh, justice on the, the Cherokee JAT. The next case is uh, Navajo Nation versus Means, or actually I think it's called Means versus District Court of the Chinle District at Navajo. And this is one of my favorite criminal cases uh, coming out of, uh, of tribal courts over the years. Uh, Russell Means had been a, had, was a member of a tribe in South Dakota. He was a non-member Indian. Uh, this is at a period of time after Duro versus Reina, but and the Duro fix in which Congress tried to restore uh, the tribal jurisdiction, criminal jurisdiction over non-member Indians, but before United States versus Lara, in which the Supreme Court said that Congress had the authority to enact the Duro fix. So Russell Means was arguing that as a non-member Indian, the Navajo Nation had no jurisdiction over him, and largely adopted in his argument the theory uh, that was expounded by Justice Kennedy in Duro versus Reina. Incidentally, the, the, court, the case was argued at the Harvard Law School, uh, in, in part organized by, once again, my wife went on a single, who back then was not my wife, but a, a second or third year law student. The Navajo Nation Supreme Court issued an opinion that I think is one of the more striking and really interesting reads out of tribal courts. They rejected the Duro versus theory argument on one hand and said fundamentally it's irrelevant because we have a treaty right under the 1868 treaty that the Navajo signed in which they have authority to, re to, re to um, respond to crimes committed by so-called bad men, which would include um, apparently, at least allegedly, Russell Means. Um, and they also argued that they had an exceptionally good reason for uh, asserting jurisdiction over non-members altogether, not just non-member Indians, uh, that so many crimes had been committed on the reservation by non-members, and that um, they had a, a sort of a practical reason for prosecuting people like Russell Means, in that the United States Attorney's Office probably wasn't going to prosecute him, the state would have no jurisdiction otherwise. And uh, fantastically, a, an excellent other reason for uh, prosecuting Russell Means was that he had actually participated in the political acti as, as a political actor at Navajo. Um, although he, you know, denied it, and later on in federal court he denied it again, he was actually eligible to serve on a jury at Navajo, and this is sort of a, 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 a new thing in Indian country where non-Indians and non-members are, are encouraged to and may actually be forced to sit as jurors in tribal, um, in, in tribal juries. Um, he was actually eligible. He had participated in the political situation at Navajo, um, but he refused to sign up for the jury pool, and so therefore uh, he was ineligible for the jury pool. Uh, but it was interesting because as a matter of political theory, at least as expounded in Duro v. Reina by Justice Kennedy, um, he shouldn't have been, uh, he, he wouldn't have been, um, uh, he, he never would have, if he, had, if he had signed up, he would essentially have consented to uh, tribal jurisdiction and, and chose not to. Um, the next case on the list is a combination of a religious freedom case and a um, natural resources regulation case involving a, a non-member, this time specifically a non-Indian, Hoopa Valley Tribe versus Buchanan, which eventually did make it to an en banc opinion affirming tribal authority uh, before the Ninth Circuit. But the Hoopa Valley Trial Court case and, and especially the Hoopa Valley Supreme Court decision is, uh, is a beautiful example of great tribal court writing. Uh, in that case, the tribe had adopted a buffer zone around some religious um, uh, sacred sites on the reservation, some of which tra apparently trampled on uh, and, and, and incurred, incurred on the, um, uh, some of the, the lands owned by non-Indians, in this case, Roberta Buganik. Buganik wanted to, to cut down a couple acres of trees, sell off, uh, uh, the timber, which in Ahupa, timber is very valuable, sell off the timber and use it to make her retirement home uh, on the area that she had uh, clear cut. And the tribe objected to that because it was within the buffer zone. The state of California, interestingly, issued an, 